Um, yeah, so uh, I looked at a lot of samples in the Devonian. Uh, the Devonian has always been a very problematic time for paleomagnetism. Um, and so this has affected basically everything in the Devonian. Um, the time scales, so the polarity pattern is not very well known. Uh, there's bits that are gray, um, but also paleopoles have been affected and there's, um, well, the amount of paleo intensities is increasing. Um, and so we wanted to basically uh, have a look at the, um, uh, the polarity patterns. So we selected three sections in Germany, Canada, uh, and Poland, and we tried to do magnetostigraphy on them. Uh, they showed little evidence for uh, remineralization or significant heating. So the chances of uh, primary directions uh, in these sections were very good. Um, but we show that basically uh, there's still a lot of trouble. Um, all the samples are very weak. Um, they, uh, so that excludes the possibility of a lot of um, rock magnetic techniques. So we were basically limited to copper bridge runs. Um, and even though um, the samples were likely not overprinted because they had no overprint conditions met, we do see big overprints. So we see everywhere uh, present day field overprints and also a Kaiman direction. So that is the Burmo Carboniferous Reverse Supercron. And then we basically see uh, three types of behavior. Um, so for the, the section from Germany, we see something that might be a Devonian primary direction, but we only have um, one polarity and we don't have any field tests because the section is uh, flat lying. Uh, for the section in Poland, we see both polarities. And for the section in Canada, we basically see random directions. And then we looked at um, all the other Devonian data. So we looked at the magnetostratigraphy. So this is part of the pattern in the Frenian Fomenian, which is based on random data. Um, we had a look at a lot of paleopole papers. So I looked at more than 80 papers. Um, and what we see is basically that the field in the Devonian looks very strange. Uh, there is basically no good convincing data. Um, and we also see very weak paleo intensities. So we are now thinking that perhaps uh, the field was very weak and in a very poor shape. And we're asking the question whether uh, there is a link to all these biotic crises in the Devonian. Uh, and we're making a call out to everyone to publish Devonian data because I think that there might be a lot more, um, uh, there might be a lot more attempts that people did, but they haven't managed to publish it because the data was just so weird or of poor quality. Um, so yeah, please publish your data because that's the only way that we can understand the field in the Devonian. And I'll be happy to uh, discuss this at some other point with anyone. Thank you very much. Who is, is anyone else wanting to present? Uh, Hannah uh, just put, uh, yeah. I could hop on if no one wants to go. Uh, I think Great. Hannah just, oh yeah. Oh, no, Hannah, you go, <laughs> yeah, you go, you spoke up. You sure? Okay, um, let me just get my, Okay, you should be able to see a poster. Is that right? Yeah, we can. I can't see what you're seeing. So, um, yeah. Hello, I'm Hannah, and my poster is on the application of spherical Slepian functions to the inversion of virtual observatory satellite magnetic data into localized regions of flow on the core mantle boundary. So our research is motivated by improving the international geomagnetic reference field model. The IGRF is updated every five years, but due to our poor understanding of how the core flow is changing, the 2015 to 2020 forecast error was much larger than we expected. We want to improve forecasts of magnetic field change by better understanding individual regions of flow on the core mantle boundary. Study of these regions are motivated by four main points. The assumptions required when inverting from field to flow, which define the flow uniquely over part, only part of the core, sur core surface, such as the tangentially geostrophic flow model, flow assumption. Uh, number two, 
uh, we want to investigate different fluid motions in different regions of the core, such as the column above and below the inner core. Um, three, there's sometimes spatially uneven data collection. And four, investigating how features on the base of the mantle affects flow on the core mantles on the outer core surface. So from seismic anomalies and thermal anomalies. So I've been working with Kathy Whaler and Kieran Began to apply a mathematical technique called Slapian functions to core flows on the core mantle boundary. The Slapian functions have previously been used extensively in geodesy, gravity and crustal magnetic field models as the functions allow a spatio-spectral trade-off in order to constrain spherical harmonics within a region of interest on the sphere. My poster is focused on the impact of these large low shear velocity provinces um, on the base of the mantle, which are a seismic anomaly, and also kind of trying to demonstrate the current limitations that we have when uh, using the spherical Slepian functions. Um, we've been incorporating Slepian functions into our inversions of a virtual observatory magnetic data sets so that we can directly invert into a region as opposed to constraining the flow after an inversion has taken place. Our flow models when using Slepian functions show an improvement in the, in the preservation of small features. And we've reduced the speeds outside of the L LSVP patches, kind of like here. Um, but there's still quite a lot of um, flow outside these regions. Um, moving forward, we've got quite a lot of plans, so we want to keep investigating different regions and remove upward continuation as part of our inversions and maybe use altitude cognizant slapping functions instead, which would allow our functions to be dependent on the downward continuation and not a step that we have to kind of work around but I can explain that more in person. Um, so thanks a lot. Feel free to come and talk to me about slapping functions, the impact of LSVPs on core flow, uh, inversions, virtual observatories, or just to say hi. So thanks. Thank you. Well, you know, I, I you know, just come by, see my poster. I can, I can just talk about it real quickly. Uh, uh, at Liverpool, we've been working on updating the uh, pale intensity pint database, uh, a real big push. And in particular, um, trying to add the, the QPI aspect and try to fill in as much as we can of the pint data set. And um, so this is a bit of a teaser of that, but the pint. Yeah, we can. Yep. So, um, so my poster is on the pale intensity results um, I've gotten as part of a collaboration between Liverpool and Curtin University um, from the 2.6 billion year old rocks uh, from the Yilgarn Craton. Um, they've previously been looked at for directions. Can I get rid of you? Um, by one of the PhD students over there and they showed that despite the fact that there's been several generations of dike swarms in the area, you do actually appear to have the CHRM component at quite high temperatures from about like 530 to 565 degrees. And the magnetic mineralogy of the samples looks really good. Um, Kappa Bridge and VFTB Thermomag. Um, for a lot of the samples I've been looking at, they show you know, really clearly magnetite Curie temperatures, um, very fine grains because of the exolution um, of, uh, of the magnetite and ilmenite. Um, yeah, pretty fine grain based on the uh, day plot. Um, so I did paleo intensity on what I could, both uh, thermal uh, and microwave teleotype, as well as shore method. And I did do LTD, shore and thermal telea um, with the easy protocol, but none of the LTD stuff passed. It seemed to give really terrible pass rates and none of it could really be accepted. Um, but you've got some nice generally, I mean, two slope, but very clearly linked to the overprint in most most cases and also um, the CHRM intensity still represents a decent amount of the overall intensity of the samples and yeah um, only five sites um, we were able to get passable measurements but that's still quite reasonable um, 
So I know Richard earlier was asking about um, the ICN pattern and uh, what it should look like. And um, well, the Aubert et al. 2009, the thing that we kind of all talk about with um, the weakening field leading up to IC, uh, to inner core nucleation at either some time between like 1.5 to 1.3 billion years or 1.1 billion years or even 500 MA. Um, if you're expecting really quite strong paleo intensity measurements, um, sort of around 2.6 GA based on this, they are definitely sort of quite low compared to what you'd expect. And also um, quite low compared to the Widjimutha dikes that are sort of closest in time and location around 2.4 billion years. Um, but yeah, so there has been more recent research which suggests that actually we wouldn't see um, a spike in a core nucleation, the Lando et al. 2017 paper. Um, so I guess with the low results, you could argue, well, you need a lot better coverage of the Precambrian, but maybe we are seeing more variation and the 2000 and the weakening field trend is just an underlying trend that we're also seeing variation on top of, or maybe we're just kind of putting on a trend. I, I don't know, um, but yeah, you can come see my poster. I think I've just explained all of it, sorry. And how do I stop the screen share? Thank you very much, Louise. Uh, Dan, do you want to go next? Oh, yeah. um, let me see if that works. Can you see my PDF? Yeah, we can. Okay, that works. So this is my yearly project update that I do every year at Magnetic Interactions. I am looking at paleo intensities in the Ida Karen period, because in, in this period we had some anomalous directional results. And it's also quite interesting because it should be around the area of, or it could be around the area of inner core nucleation. So what we did is we did a multi-method intensity study, well, more of them actually. And but now we have about even over a thousand intensity specimens that have been measured. A bit over half of them come from microwave and, and thermal tellier methods and the rest is double heating Shaw, pseudo tellier or from Wilson experiments. We have success rates that differ depending on, on site and method between zero and 25%. And the ones that do pass pretty much all look, look the same. We get our two slope behavior and have to be quite careful to differentiate between two slope behavior and sagging array plots. But it is quite helpful that we do get directional changes at the same point where there's a bend between, between the two slopes. And basically look the same for, for thermal tellier and microwave tellier. And the results here, the ones that I'm showing are all lower than, than two microteslas and microwave and thermal results do agree pretty well there. If you look at, at Shaw, we can't really see a two slope behavior um, well, you can if you use your imagination and the same for pseudo Tellier. But if we compare what we get from, from the three methods, then, then they all agree pretty well. And usually the lowest results come from, from the pseudo Tellier method. So if we look at the, the VDMs at this time period, we can see that all of them are really, really low. We have an, an orange here, Richard Bono's a uh, single crystal result and pretty much all of what we've been measuring between 600 and 560 ma has been has been agreeing pretty well with with that and it basically looks like it's it's getting even weaker as it gets older and we get a bit of different results around 550 so we get higher bill intensities here and if i say higher i'm talking about like 10 micro tesla so for context uh, the present day field strength in this plot would be up here somewhere. And if you look at all of the intensities, the low and the high ones, and compare those to, 
to younger uh, distributions of dipole moments, then we can see they are really different from anything we can see after that. Even the hyperactivity periods do not even close give us uh, intensities that that low as we see in, in the idiot Karen. So what we also did is, is look at directional circular variation. And when we started to do that, it really gave us results that looked pretty similar to what we would get from, from PSV10, apart from the uh, from the error bars that we see. But I've done a bit more on that by now and have been a I've been getting a bit stricter with my criteria of what to use and what not to use. And I don't have a final result yet, but it looks like it will give us a uh, model GA that is a bit higher than what we see here and a B value that is quite a bit lower than, than what we get here. And yeah, at this point, I can give you the, the same conclusion that I've been giving you every year, namely that the, the field was pretty weird back then and also very weak. But now we can also say that it looks like it has been weak over an extended period of time, maybe 40 million years and maybe even longer. And, does it, and that it seems to change at the Edia Karen Cambrian transition. And it seems to get stronger there. And I think that's pretty much all I can say here. Just come by and then we can have a chat about details. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is there another one? Becky is just put us something. Yeah. Please. Uh, so I'm now going to take you guys all the way to Antarctica. Welcome to the Amundsen Sea. Uh, so here is an area of interest more recently. Um, and you may have heard about this in the news about Thwaites Glacier and its concern for for sort of ice and sea levels. Um, so this was an IODP expedition that took place in January 2019. Um, and I did not sail on this cruise, I'll be upfront. Um, but I'm working on U channels that were collected from site U1533, which is shown here in this star. Um, and so we have fifth, I've been working on the Pleistocene section from this cruise to sort of work out what's been happening recently. Um, so my main aims are sort of to refine the magnetostratigraphic framework that was sort of collected on the ship um, try and produce an RPI record because as we sort of look in the Southern Ocean, there aren't very many paleo intensity records from new channels and sediment cores um, that sort of exist. And if they do exist, they're quite short. Um, so try and work out whether this is possible here at site U1533. And then to look at the environmental magnetism of this site and all this together should be able to tell us sort of a bit more about what was the paleoclimate like at site U1533 sort of during the Pleistocene. Um, so my results so far are pretty good and um, we've refined the magnetostratigraphic framework and um, we have all the major polarity reversals sort of for the last two and a half million years um, and on my poster you'll see sort of that there's uh, highlighted excursions that have been depicted from uh, deconvolution of the record that I've got. Um, I've also got a really good sort of start to the relative paleo intensity record. So this is sort of highlighted here in this figure. Um, so this is my paleo intensity and it shows really good correlation to the PISO 1500 stack, which is a reference stack that sort of it is sort of from 12 cores from across the world that's correlated to um, the oxygen 18 record. So this is this dark green line on this graph. Uh, but unfortunately, sort of it's only 1.5 million years long and my record extends further than that. So this stack here uh, is an equatorial Pacific stack, which as you can see from my gray bars, which correlate down to the paleo intensity, they sort of vanish after this point. And this could be either because the Pacific stack that I've chosen to use isn't a good one, so I need to find a better stack to compare to, um, or it could be some change in behavior sort of later on here. So these orange bars are major polarity reversals that are shown better on the full poster, 
Um, so here is the Bruins cron. Uh, this is the gauss matiyama boundary. Um, so there may be some sort of change here. Um, I should point out this gap in the record is a U channel that was not sampled with the rest of the U channels, um, but we will re should receive that later on uh, sort of to fill in that gap and work out what's happening in that space as well. Um, so beyond that for future work, uh, I'm going to validate those excursions that I mentioned to sort of work out uh, whether they're true, whether they're to do with changes in magnetic grain size or mineralogy and um, sort of deeper look into the core descriptions to see whether there's a physical uh, visible reason for those excursions. Um, and then if they are true excursions, there are quite a lot of them in the Bruins cron, which can help tie down the age model better for the younger section of this record. And then I'm going to plan to do sort of rock, ma rock magnetic experiments too, to sort of uh, fill it off, fill up sort of the rest of the information to work out what is recording everything and then see sort of how does that change environmentally in the Amundsen Sea. So yeah, come to my poster and hopefully I will do better there. Thank you very much. I think there's one more from Ben. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just trying to share the screen. Okay. Cool. Yeah, so in this, we've been looking at um, paleocircular variation off to the PCRS. And so compile the, the Triassic direction BGP database and incorporate this into the longer time interval, which we're calling the post PCRS. And amongst other things, um, we found behavior in this time to be very similar to what observed in the pre CNS, which includes Jurassic high productivity. So, as a bit of background, uh, yeah, the PSB is commonly studied as VGP scatter, and this relationship is often expressed with model G, which is defined by um, coefficients A and B, which you can get in this uh, equation. Um, and several studies have um, looked into intervals since the beginning of the PCRS. However, most of the triassic is not included in these. And so these studies are look, looking at normally a, a, a relationship between PSV behavior and average reversal frequency, where the quantifying PSV would be a ratio from model G. Um, however, like the nature of this relationship is still unclear. And so this study is looking at what maybe triassic PSV behavior may be able to tell us about this relationship and also making use of a, a new idea that model G A parameter may be able to provide um, information regarding morphology of the geomagnetic field. So as well as uh, compiling post PCRS database, I've compiled a new PCRS database just to allow for a direct comparison as now uh, both intervals will satisfy the same selection criteria. We estimated a VGP scatter and the model G coefficients for each time interval and looked at how the data selected influenced the observed dispersions. So we investigated effects of serial correlation and excluding data derived from great circles. And on top of this, we use some additional selection criteria to generate higher quality database and then check the robustness of the dispersions that we see. And finally, our results were compared with those from other published data compilations representing intervals since the PCRS. And so uh, in the results, what we see is a uh, little evidence of a relationship between VGP scatter and latitudes uh, given in figure one. And then, yeah, in figure two, we can see that the, the PCRS showed a strong increase in scatter with latitude with good agreement with the model G fit. And incorporating the things like serial correlation and gray circle data had little effect. So they weren't really taken into consideration in the end. And then, um, yeah, this was also true uh, when using the higher quality data. So the overall dispersion was pretty much the same, suggesting the dispersions to be robust features of, of each time interval. And then when compared with other time intervals since the post PCRS, we see the VGP dispersion is very similar to that observed in the pre CNS. Um, this is demonstrated by the, the similarity in the model G shape parameters. And in figure three, you can see the, the like nearly identical BA ratios. And this type of behavior, this latitudinal invariance is traditionally thought to represent times of high reversal frequency, such as the Jurassic hyperactivity in the pre-CNS. But here we see there's very consistent behavior at the time interval between the two supercrons, despite quite a large variation in apparent reversal frequency. So perhaps suggesting that uh, any relationship between reversal frequency and PSV is more complex. Um, maybe future, future studies should uh, treat this as one time interval. And then 
Also, like in the, the recent paper from Bigan and others at the back end of last year, where we find shear parameters don't, do not necessarily call vary. And so as a result, maybe the traditional interpretation appears to be outdated. So from this study, it's, it looks possible that su supercrons occur when A is lower, and so axial dipole dominance is greater, which is the field morphology I was talking about earlier. And um, however, the CNS is only slightly, but not statistically distinct from time of reversals, which from this would make it difficult to, to say for certain. And then if you were to look for like a, a new meaning behind model G, B parameter perhaps, then that could be related to field intensity or average VDM, where you see the lower values um, in between the two supercrons could maybe roughly agree with an extended mesozoic dipole law. However, we need a lot more paleo intensity data to, to look into that. And then finally, it would seem that the PCRS is a unique time interval um, over at least the last 300 million years or so regarding PSV behavior. Uh, estimates of the uh, model G parameters are very different and statistically distinct from times of reversals. And using the power law associated with model G A parameter, which just a time of like unique um, axial dipole dominance. So maybe this could be responsible for its extended duration compared to the CNS or maybe uh, an artifact of the log of the supercon. So yeah, if anyone's interested, come and find me.